Does anyone know what I'm saying? So my Sundays were consumed from the moment we got up to the moment we went to sleep. We'd be in church. We'd have meetings with people. We'd have people over our house. This is every Sunday of our life. Sundays are consumed with people. Busy, 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 busy. Life is full on a Sunday. It's all people. Uh, just We're just there serving, giving our life to try and connect people to God. So that's been our life for the last 19, almost 20 years. But Saturdays for me... Uh, and our family are what I like to call lazy Saturdays. Does anyone like to have lazy Saturdays? Some of us like to have a lazy every day. <laughs> but I have this thing called lazy Saturdays. And it's a day where I have no agenda, no plans, no meetings. There is no people. Like, I know I'm a pastor. But can I just be honest with you? On Saturday, I don't want to see you. <laughs> don't talk to me. I, I just want to chill. I want to relax. That may shock some of you. But hey, pastors are human. And so Saturdays for me are just a day to chill, a day to relax, a day to do nothing. Where I don't have any plans, any agenda. I want to sleep in, I'm going to sleep in. If I want to go have a coffee at the cafe, I'm going to go do that. I just want to do whatever I want to do. Because Sundays in our life is very full, like many of you. But I remember many years ago when my three children who I just showed you were a lot smaller, maybe one, three, and five. They were a lot, they were a lot younger and, and uh, it was one of our lazy Saturday mornings. Like we were having a lazy Saturday. We went to sleep on Friday night and said to my wife, what are we doing tomorrow? She goes, don't know, who cares? <laughs> Let's just relax. And so we woke up, I mean, we went to sleep and the next morning it's about 5.30 in the morning. Now, my children get up really early. I don't know why, they just get up really early. They always have, even now, my children are teenagers, they still wake up early. So how many people have teenagers here? Or, or older children? Apparently they sleep in more when they become teenagers. Is that true? I still haven't hit that path yet. <laughs> they still wake up early, I don't know why. But anyway, this one particular morning, it was about 5.30 in the morning, and, and, and my daughter com comes into my room, into our room. And she jumps on our bed. And my wife and I, uh, you know, we're asleep. And she's like, hey, you know, come on, wake up. She, she, she wants to hang out with mum and dad, right? And, and we're like, you know, leave us alone. <laughs> Get out, you know, just leave us alone. But she's just jumping on the bed and pestering us because she wants to hang out with mum and dad. A few minutes later, my son comes in. And then he jumps on our bed. And he starts to pester mum and dad. He, he's like maybe about three years of age. And he wants to hang out with mum and dad. He wants to chill. He's like, hey, what are we doing? Come on, wake up. And we're like, you know, get out. We kind of want to just relax. A few minutes later, my oldest daughter comes in. And she's about five. And now I've got three children. There's five of us on our queen-size bed. And it's about 5.30, 5.45 in the morning. And we are not wanting to do anything but my three children just walk into our room and they start to pester us. Then they grab my phone and they grab my wife's iPad and now they're sitting on our bed and they're playing on the iPad, you know, technology. We call these things animation sedation. <laughs> you give this to a kid and it just sedates them. I'm not saying it's good, okay? Actually, I think it's unhealthy sometimes. But the truth is, it's animation sedation. So they're, they're sitting on our bed and now they're playing on our iPads and our iPhones and and I'll never forget because my oldest daughter, Esther, she grabs a photo out. And I'm going to show you this, this image. And uh, if, you, if you have that ready, Kenneth. <laughs> Can you see that? Can you see that photo? Let me just get out of your way. That, 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 uh, my daughter grabbed that photo out of my wife's bedside table. And uh, it's, it's actually me. Some of you probably don't believe, you, believe me, but it's, it's me. Some of you, <laughs> he's like, wow. <laughs> Nothing's changed. What, nothing's changed. <laughs> still got the six-pack under there somewhere in faith, <laughs> believing that it's still there. But that's me. I've got, I've got a six-pack, and I'm, I'm about maybe 18 years of age there. I've been a Christian for a year. And uh, it's funny. That, that, I remember we were away on a camp. I never wore a shirt that whole youth camp. Never wore a shirt. It may be different in your culture, but in Australia, we live on the beach. It's kind of okay. And uh, I never wore a shirt the whole camp. These days, I don't want to take my shirt off. <laughs> anyway, my daughter grabs this photo out of my wife's bedside table, looks at it, then looks at me and says, Dad, he looks like you, only he's not fat. 
Don't you love your children sometimes? And you want to knock them into next week in Jesus' name, of course. And so she made this statement and it got me thinking because my children just walked into our room, right? It's Saturday morning. It, we want to relax. We don't want to do anything, but they, they just come in at 5.30 in the morning. They grab our phones. They grab our iPads. They, my daughter grabs this photo and then makes a statement about her dad being too fat. Now, th- the truth is, like, I am a pastor. I do love people, but, but if you came into my room at 5.30 in the morning on a Saturday morning, I, I tell you what, I'm not going to be the most. Here's the truth. We have access to the presence of God. We have this access all areas pass when it comes to the presence of God. And when I heard Pastor Danny sharing last night, I was so uh, wrapped because I, I knew I was talking about the presence of God today. And Don't you love that? Come on now. We weren't conversing. We haven't been messaging or talking. What are you talking about? I'll talk about this. You talk about that. Then I'll talk. There's been, there's been none of that. He just shared that word so powerfully about Obed. Was it Obed Edom? Did I get about the ark and, you know, taking the presence of God for granted and being disrespectful. And I'm thinking, man, I want to, this is what I'm talking about this morning, which will kind of dovetail really nicely. I love that. I like it. Don't, not sure about you, but I like it. And so when you think about this, my children, right, they have this access to my life because I'm their father. So when they came into our room, there is no hesitation. Think about it. They just boldly walked into our room. There's no requirements. There's no fear from them. There's no doubt. They're not wondering to themselves, I wonder if we're allowed in mum and dad's room. No, no, they they don't think like this. They're our children. And so they just boldly come into our room because they know as as their father and as their mother, they, they have this... This access, they're not wondering, should we be here? Shouldn't we be here? They're not thinking to themselves, am I worthy to be in this room? Am I worthy to be in the presence of my dad? And I want to talk to you about this reality that you and I have this access all areas pass when it comes to the presence of God. And when we realize, and sometimes it's kind of what Pastor Danny was sharing about last night, when we sometimes as Christians, we go along in the journey of faith. We can forget that what we are a part of and what we have access to when it comes to the presence of God and we can become familiar. Come on, church. We become familiar with who we are serving. But we have to understand because we have this access, all areas pass, we must treasure and know that the presence of God is ultimately all that we need because it is in the presence of God where He starts to change the way that we think. He starts to change the way that we live. He will change the way way that we speak. He will create this boldness and this courage in our lives where we cannot and will not live the same ever again. But it is really ultimately only found in the presence of God. And I love this about Jesus because there is no requirements. (laughs) Like most of life requires a pass. If you want to go to a concert, you need a ticket. I just went to Disneyland last Monday with my daughter. First time I've been to Disneyland. Oh, my gosh. It's next level, okay? Next, it's crazy. I'm sure, how many people have been to Disneyland or Disney World? It's like wild. In, in my city, we have five theme parks, five, on the Gold Coast in Australia. The Gold Coast in Australia is the largest holiday destination for Australia. It's the biggest tourist place. We have five theme parks. I've got to tell you, those theme parks now for me, are like so boring (laughs) because I've been to Disneyland. I'm like, man, we need to pick up our game in Australia. But you go to Disneyland, guess what? You need a ticket. Go to a concert, you need a pass. Go to a conference, you need to register. You think of most of our recreational life, there's demands, there's a requirement, there's certain things you have to have before you can access that concert, before you can access whatever that may be, but when it comes to the presence of God, we have this access all areas pass. You don't, you don't need a certain requirement. There's no demands. There's, no, there's none of this conditional, you know, whether I'm smart enough, if I'm rich enough, if I'm good enough, then I can maybe access the presence of God. That's not, that's not the Bible. Amen. 
and the Bible does say in Matthew, here, let's just go to the Bible on that note. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, it says this, When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, and at that moment the curtain of the temple, or the veil of the temple, was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split, and the tombs broke open. In the book of Matthew here in chapter 27, the Bible's telling us that Jesus is on the cross and is his last moments on earth, being fully human and fully God. And he's hanging on the cross and the Bible says he gave up his spirit and he cried out in a loud voice and he gave up, he gave up his life. Like this is powerful. And I know this message, by the way, is very simple, like it is. It's very simple, but it's quite fundamental to our faith. And, and sometimes the simple things are the things we can miss. We can forget the power of the, of the simple things. And it's so critical that we understand the ramifications of, of what the Bible is saying here, the, the power of what the Bible is saying, because if we just read that and, you know, it says the curtain was torn from top to bottom. We've, we've got to understand the power of this. And, and can I just take you in, into the, the reality of what's happened here again, afresh for some of us, you know this, but can I just take you back there afresh again? Is that all right? You see, what the Bible is saying here and articulating to us is in the olden days, ancient history, in ancient Israel, the Bible tells us that, that God's presence was, was contained behind the veil, behind the curtain. There was a temple, you know, a building made of all this unbelievable material and there was three different departments, if you like, compartments of that temple. And God's presence was put in a place called the Holy of Holies. And there was a huge curtain and a veil that, that separated the presence of God from everybody else. And the Bible explains to us that there was only one person who could access the presence of God. That person was the was the high priest. Now the high priest to access the presence of God, he had to do a go through a whole lot of religious service. He had to shed the blood of animals, he had to wash his hands, and if he did not get the process right, he would go behind the veil and in the presence of God, if he didn't get it right, he would drop dead in the presence of God. This is crazy. This is how it was before Jesus came. In other words, nobody could get to God except for one person who was the high priest. And even then, he could only get to God once, once a year. You can read about this and just write this down. It's in Leviticus chapter 16. It gives you the whole process of what the high priest had to do. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7, you can write that down. It talks about how only the high priest could enter the inner room behind the veil explains all this in the Bible and I, I want to talk about this because I want us to develop a deeper heart that will access the presence of God because when we access his presence there's so many things that we access amen are you good you okay and the Bible even says this in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 it says we can boldly enter into God's presence the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf. Even when I read that, for me, even now, it, it messes with my head. In a good way. <laughs> because the Bible's saying that, that we can now boldly access the presence of God because of what Jesus has done. The only reason that we can live and breathe and worship and praise and literally the reason we woke up this morning is because of God's presence. And the only reason we can do that is, is because of what Christ has done on the cross where once he gave his life, he was the ultimate sacrifice, the only one that can open up this gateway, if you like, this doorway to access the presence of God was through the life, 
death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why I say to you this morning, when I talk about Jesus and when I think about the presence of God and when I understand at a deeper level in my life how good God really is and where I belong without the grace of God, I cannot help but get excited because I understand something that because of what Jesus has done on the cross that day, all of a sudden there was only one dude who could get to the the presence of God. He was the high priest. He could only go there once a year, but everybody else was shut out from the presence of God. But when Jesus Christ came to earth and shed his blood on the cross, all of a sudden that, that blockage, that curtain, that veil that separated us from the good graces and the presence of God has now been torn from top to bottom, which enables me and you to all of a sudden boldly Oh, come on, church, to boldly walk into the presence of God and not to be afraid and not to be scared and not to wonder, am I worthy to be here or not to doubt, just like my children do. They don't question. They don't doubt. They're not wondering. They just know. This is my father. I will go to him whenever I like. And that's what the Bible is saying here, that we have this privilege, this honor of being able to access God's presence anytime, anywhere, any place. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what you do, in your Monday to your Saturday, you can access the presence of God because God is no longer contained behind some curtain. God is no longer just contained on a Sunday. Come on now, church. I mean, I love being in church on Sundays. I'm in church somewhere. Every Sunday of my life, worshipping and hearing the word, if not preaching it. But guess what? God is not just there on Sunday. He's there on the Monday. He's there on the Tuesday, the Wednesday, the Thursday, the Friday. And, and I want to live in a way where I'm accessing His presence every day of my life. Amen. Now, I'm just going to give you a couple of things when it comes to the presence of God. Just maybe one, maybe two. Maybe I'll just do one, Pastor Denny. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing yourself. And by the way, I think, that, I think we should give him a hand. Oh, honestly, that was really beautiful last night. I took some notes, just so you know. Um, I'll steal some of the stuff. I'll reword it and reshape it a little bit. Then I'll call it my own. <laughs> if that's all right with you. <laughs> well, you're a great blessing, Pastor Danny. I've only just recently really started to get to know you. and Man, just hearing some of your stories. As people have told me about you. Uh, but man, it's amazing, you know, just your zeal and passion is something to be, it's inspiring. I'm I'm not calling you old, (laughs) but you're older than me. (laughs) And as a 41-year-old guy, I want to keep that same zeal and passion in my life, you know, to the day I die. Amen. And uh, you're a great blessing in Jesus' name. I'm just going to give you a couple of things this morning. When it comes to the presence of God, that what, what is it you access? I mean, the truth is we access so much in the presence of God. We access His power for, for healing. We access His, His goodness. We access His grace. We access His favor. There's so many things that we access when we access the presence of God. But I'm going to give you a couple of things, maybe one, maybe two, and then I'm just going to wrap it up. Is that all right? Here's the first thing. When you access the presence of God, you access your true identity, your identity. You access your identity. This is really, really powerful because even at my age now and in in my travels, I I talk to an identity issue is just not with teenagers or young people. There's many many an older person that don't know who they are. Amen. They still haven't quite worked out who they are and how God has shaped them. But when you access the presence of God, you start to realize who you really are. Are. And when you and I know who we are, we start to live accordingly because once we know how God has shaped us, how He has wired us, how He has formed us, we start to relax into our own skin and we don't live under the pressure or the tyranny of what the world may say about us. Amen. And so this identity is only accessed in the presence of God. And when you think about this, I think one of the biggest and most pertinent questions that humankind's ask is this one right here. Who am I? 
People all over the world, there's 7 billion plus people on earth now that walk around and they will ask this question, who am I? The second question people will ask is, what am I here for? What am I born for? What is the purpose of my, of my life? Now, the reality is nobody's walking around saying this, like as in saying it, you know, walking down the street, because that's weird. <laughs> That's strange. You imagine somebody going to walk around, who am I? Somebody tell me, who am I? Please, please help me. Who am I? They're not doing that. But you can know for sure that internally, people are asking the question. Come on now. People do it in church. In our churches every week, people are wondering who they are, wondering what they were put on planet Earth to do. And when it comes to our identity, we find it in the presence of of God. We have a generation, this thing called, and I'm sure it's here in America, it's called an identity crisis. There's literally an identity crisis on planet Earth. There are people that are reading magazines, watching TV, trying to get their identity from something or someone. But the truth is we can only find out who we really are when we are in the presence of God because it is God who has shaped us, who has created our lives, who knows everything about us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen. But he knows us. And so when we're in the presence of God, what happens is he starts to reveal to us who we really are and how we are wired and how we are shaped. And I think about this all the time. And even in Australia, we have a lot of this. And I know this for sure in America, there's a thing called identity theft. It's a crime. It's actually a crime you are charged for where people literally steal somebody else's identity because they like who they are or they want what they have. It's crazy. It's crazy to me because it tells you something that, that people are longing, longing to know who they are and we find out who we are and it's, it's only in the presence of God where we understand who we truly are and write this down and if you're taking notes, write this down. The, no, the natural and normal human struggle, the natural and normal human struggle is to look for our identity horizontally. Like the natural struggle, the human struggle we have is to look for our identity horizontally. But we are hardwired by God to get our identity vertically. Does that, does that make sense? Like naturally, we're, we're looking for our identity horizontally. In other words, my vocation. How much money do I earn? What house do I have? What's my postal address? Who am I connected to? These are things that human beings wrestle with. We're, we're, we're trying to latch our identity onto certain things. And maybe it's our income. Maybe it's our social status. Maybe it's, it, it's the people we know. Maybe it's the car I drive, the house I have. I'm not sure what it is, but all of us can wrestle with our identity. And what we're trying to do often is to find it horizontally. In other words, if, if I've got a, a high-paying job and, 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 I, and I've got a good income, then, then I'm... That's, that's who I am. I've pastor, I, I, I work as a, a top accountant and that's, that's who I am. And, I, and, and that's not our identity. It's a part of what we do. Come on now. It's a part of who we are. But actually, we're not meant to get our identity horizontally. God has shaped us and hardwired us to find our identity, identity vertically with Him first. In other words, in His presence, when we are communicating and in our communion with the Holy Spirit and with His presence, God shows us and He reveals to us who we really are. And when we start to understand our identity, we do not long, any longer live under the pressure of the world's mentality. Amen. Because the world does have a mentality and it does have an expectation. And there are these pressures for us to live up to a certain standard, according to a certain pattern. But I don't know about you this morning. I want to live according to the Word of God, according to His principles, according to His presence. And I can only do that when I know who I am and I know how God has shaped me. And in my communion with the Holy Spirit, He reveals to me. And then I no longer live with insecurities and fears in my life. Amen. 
And this is true when you look at every kind of human being you can run into. You see, the truth is, I am not someone because I am in ministry. I am someone and I am something because Christ is in me and I am in Christ. I am not someone or something because I may have a lot of money. I am something and I am someone because Christ literally is in me and I am in Christ. And that is what you call true identity and you find it in the life of Jesus Christ. Oh, I like this. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but please just stay with me for a few moments because I love this about the Holy Spirit, about the presence of God and about what he does with Jesus. The Bible tells us, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. You, I'm sure you know it. It's where Jesus has been baptized. John the Baptist is like, no, I, I can't do this. But Jesus is like, you must. And John baptizes him and the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and speaks to Jesus and says, This is my Son, whom I love and I am well pleased with. This is the life of Jesus here where we find it's important to note that as Jesus has been baptized and he comes up out of the water, the first words he hears is from God the Father, the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, the presence of God. And he hears this voice, and the voice says to Jesus and to everybody else that was witnessing that day, this is my son, whom I love, and I am well pleased important to remember that at this point of Jesus' life, he has not lifted a finger. He has not healed anyone. He has not performed one miracle. He hasn't set anybody free. Hasn't raised anybody from the dead. No demon-possessed person has been delivered of their demons. He hasn't done any miracles. He has done nothing. Not a thing. But the first words he hears is God telling him, you're my son, I love you, and I'm well pleased. And here's why this is imperative. is because straight after this, Jesus has been led out into the wilderness. But God firstly affirms him, you're my son, I love you, Jesus, and I'm pleased with you. You see, for any wilderness you go through, you're going to need the affirmation of God. Amen. Affirmation is critical for the wilderness seasons of our life. And I love this about Jesus because, and about the Holy Spirit because he doesn't just say that to, to Christ. We, we understand this. God is our Father. <laughs> Man, this is cool. <laughs> I'm preaching myself happy this morning. <laughs> I mean, God is our Father. The Bible even says, when we pray, we say, Our Father who art in heaven. Father is a form of security of strength now you may have had a bad natural father but God the father is perfect and God speaks to Jesus as his father and says I want you to know something Jesus you are my son and I love you and I'm well pleased but God is our father and he still says these words to us he still says to us I don't know if you realize this but he says to you this morning you are my daughter I love you and I am well pleased with you you are my son I love you and I am well pleased with you what is this hap what is happening here in the life of Christ what is happening is he knows who he is because his father is giving him the identification of his son there is identity happening here. Does that make sense? When you know that you are a son or a daughter of God, it doesn't matter what other people may say about you. You start to realize, uh-uh, that's, that's, that's maybe what you say. But this is what God says about me. He says, I am his daughter. And guess what? Jesus didn't do anything for God to say that. And this is called grace. Because it's true for us. Sometimes we think we have to serve God and do hard and work hard and give, give lots and do, do, do before God's going to love us. Guess what? That's not the Bible. <laughs> 
And sometimes because of that grace, maybe sometimes we can relax a little bit. But grace doesn't allow me to relax and to to live a life of sin because I'm like, oh, well, it's all good. God's going to be good. He's good to me. Yes, He is good to me. What grace does is it causes me to love Him more. Like my wife, (laughs) she loves me, as do I her. And she's so gracious towards me. Like she's very gracious towards me. She is. She's just gracious. That grace she extends me doesn't cause me to think in my head or my heart, oh, she's so good to me. I think I might go find another woman. That's, that's not what her grace does to me. What it does when she extends grace to me is it causes me to, to love her more. Is it causes me to, to want to be with her more because I'm like, oh my gosh, you are so good to me. It doesn't, I don't say to myself, well, I'm just going to go, oh, I'm going to go live however I want to live. No, that's not the grace of God. See, when you understand the grace of God, what it causes in our life is we start to worship Him more. We honor Him more. We give more. We serve Him more. Because in the presence of God, you realize who you truly are, that you are a son, you are a daughter, that God loves you despite what you may or may not do, despite you don't serve God one iota guess what he loves you you are still his child and he's still pleased with you that's crazy but that's what happens when we're in the presence of God we have this identity where it doesn't matter what the world's trying to push onto our onto our lives and how we should live and what we should do but we understand no no I'm a child of the king of kings I am a child of the God of the universe. This is how I think. It may sound arrogant, but it's not. Honestly, I'm not an arrogant person. But I definitely have this unbelievable boldness when it comes to my Father. I'm not afraid of God. I'm not afraid of His presence. And what it does is I don't treat His presence lightly. I don't treat it disrespectfully. I don't treat it with, you know, uh, that's the presence. No, because he is so gracious to me, because he has revealed to me my true identity when he says to me that I'm his son, that he loves me, that he's well pleased me, what it does is it drives me towards his presence. Where oh my God, I, I love you, man. Wow. Like, that's how I talk to God some days. I just wake up and I'm like, I love you, Jesus. You're awesome. Man, I'm just so grateful for you. Like if I've come from Australia, just to preach some message to you, for whatever reason, it's not what I'm here for. (laughs) I'm just saying to you, I want us to have a deeper passion for the presence of God. Amen. And I'm not saying you don't. I'm just saying I want us to have a deeper commitment to the Word of God, to the presence of God, because He shows us who we really are. And my relationship with God and my identity is found vertically in in my communication with Him, not in my horizontal relationships. It's all found in the presence of God. And I'll just take you to the scripture. I don't know if I am going to get to my next point. Wow, I've done what Pastor Danny's anointings just hit me. Because it's already, what time do I need to finish? Because I just wanted to pray for us before I, (laughs) whatever. So we're here till about three in the afternoon. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Some people aren't laughing. (laughs) Sit down, preacher boy. (laughs) You see, when Jesus was baptized, God spoke those words to him. You're my son, I love you, and I'm well pleased. And when I read this in the Bible, I, I, I was a bit perplexed by this. Because in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. And he, he literally says this. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't know if you ever read this. So Jesus is is verbally communicating to God out loud, like he's saying, where are you? Why? 
like I'm just giving you my modern day version, my modern day vernacular, like what's up? Like wh- what are you doing, man? Like come on. Like why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? What's the deal, God? You're killing me here. So he's having this conversation, but guess what? The Bible does not say that God answers him. Think about this. God remains silent in the deepest, darkest moments of Christ's life on earth. He remains silent when, when Jesus is crying out to him. But when he got baptized, Jesus did not ask for anything. But God speaks to him and says, you're my son. I love you. And I'm well pleased. You see, there's something about this. And I asked the Lord, I said, God, why didn't you talk to Jesus in that moment? Why didn't you just comfort him? Why didn't you just tell him something, anything? Just let him know that you're there. And I felt like God spoke to me and he said, because what I told him at the start and at the beginning has not changed. He's still my son. I still love him and I'm still pleased with him. You see, no matter what we do in life, This is true. No matter what we do in life, we have a God in Jesus Christ who will love us and He sees us with His favourable eyes. And again, this doesn't cause us to walk away from God. It causes us to treasure His presence like never before because we realise the depth of the price that was paid and we understand something about God's goodness and His grace where we live in a way that will make decisions and determine to pursue God with all our heart to pursue the presence of God, to pursue the Word of God so that we can live in this true identity where we know that we know that we know. You may not know, but I know. Somebody else may not know, but I definitely know. I know that I know that I know. It doesn't matter what the world may say about me. I am convinced. I have this conviction that I am a child of God, that I am loved by God, that I am a son of His, and He is pleased with me and this is what you find in the presence of our God Jesus Christ where you can find nowhere else and when you think about it when you and I know who we are I believe we can live to the full potential of what God has called us to live when we know our identity in Christ And in the presence of God, we start to live to our full potential because all of us in here, no matter if you're the oldest person in here, you may be 100 years old, you may be the youngest person here, you may be 12, I'm not sure. But all of us have unbelievable potential. And God is not finished with you yet. How do I know that? You're still breathing. (laughs) If you're not breathing, you're in trouble. Well, no, you're in a good place actually, but... (laughs) But if you're not breathing, God's finished with you. But all of us in here are breathing currently, which means God is not finished with us. And we've got to be people that will pursue the presence of God and and understand our true identity is only found in Him. It's not found in our horizontal relationships. It's not found in what we do or don't do. It's found in our communion with the Holy Spirit and in His presence. And, And I know for sure the longer I've served God, the more I will press and, and look, the scripture came up on the screen, and I'm, I'm going to pray for us in a minute now. I didn't get to the other two points, but anyway. Uh, the scripture came up. 15 minutes. Yeah, I want to pray for us too. So I, they say I've got 15 minutes, but I want to pray for us. And Is that all right? You good? Because if I start that, I'm not going to finish it. There's too much in there. Um, 